Welcome back to say a uh, spotlight. Bro, you're gonna make me laugh. We are Jake and Matt. The when you put the body for the ball. Fucking hell! Go look at it. Hello and welcome back to Say A Spotlight. This is episode 118 and we're your hosts Jake and Matt here to cover all the events of Match Day 29 and what an eventful Match Day 29 it was. Absolutely eventful and it's not because of the amount of goals that took place. In uh, fact, there were hardly any goals. You yeah, know, just one goal feast um, in Frosinone Lazio, which ended 2-3. But the others, fine margins in every other game. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. But there there was a lot that happened off the pitch and on the pitch that obviously would make this quite a, an eventful one. Um, we'll get into that very soon. Our goal of the week was Milan Loney Daniel Maldini with a stunning free kick that he scored for Monza against Cagliari in off the crossbar. Only just crossed the line, but a magnificent strike. Such great technique on Daniel, man. And I could have sworn Colpani was going to take that. Um, what a lovely free kick, man. Inch perfect. Um, and that's obviously the goal of the week. I mean, close contenders. We had Noslin, who had a pretty good goal against Milan. That was a rocket. Yep. Kedira had a bicycle kick, which was purely instinctive, and the technique was there. You know, it wasn't the crispest, cleanest kind of bicycle kick you'll ever see, but, you know, instinctive, and it was, it yeah. was good. Chukweze had a lovely strike, um, and Pellegrini had a had a good goal too. Yeah, so Pellegrini's was was amazing, especially in the in the absence of Dybala. Whereas before Mourinho would make it very obvious that he only has one good player. Um, yeah. You see some some other top caliber players coming through over there, especially exactly. Captain it's like with Fantastic. every goal, they're rubbing it in his face at this point. Yeah, literally, literally. Um, we had a few. Of field antics, um, the first one that we should probably address is the fact that Atalanta Fiorentina was not played yep. um, this match day due to the unfortunate passing of Joe Barone, the director of Fiorentina. Um, it's important to mention that he he had not passed away when the decision was made, but he had fallen ill apparently in front of mm-hmm. the players, and apparently. Um, they saw it and they were disturbed essentially and yeah, uh, the yeah. game was postponed that and obviously the fact that now i don't know how close the relationship was with him but it's obviously devastating right apparently uh, he's a lovely man you know a man's man so, yeah so yeah he was probably loved and um, seeing him in that state was quite hard he was rushed to hospital and he, he passed away shortly after so that's that's um definitely yeah. sad and our wishes are with his family absolutely the absolutely. other thing is um something that i feel like we co- we cover every few months man on, on this podcast unfortunately yeah. um and it's another racial incident this time it was inter's acerbi 36 year old veteran francesco acerbi who um allegedly racially has abused juan jesus of napoli the center back um calling him the n-word basically yeah um, juan jesus immediately reported this to the referee as Acerbi was apparently, allegedly, naturally, um, apologizing to him. Um, It ended there for the time being. Um, And then in a post-match press conference, Acerbi totally denied making any claims. And Juan Jesus took it to social media going like, bro, what the fuck? You literally apologized to me on the pitch. What's this now? And now... Calling him out for being fake. Yeah, yeah. And now even... Interest to Ram has come out yeah. and said, "Listen, Acherbi, I demand answers for this. Yeah, we want answers. Yeah, and and this was during um, the, the week in which in Syria that they were campaigning for say no to racism of or course. keep racism out. And obviously, um, they do it often, but this was one of the weeks where it was on everyone's fucking sleeve. It was it was the backdrop when players were entering the pitch, um, and it wasn't the fans. The fans, I think." at least to behave themselves. Yeah. It was Acerbi, 36-year-old former Lazio captain, apparently a lovely guy. Yeah, sure, mm. whatever. <laughs> Disagree. <laughs> yeah. Um, an interesting detail is that in the referee's report, apparently Acerbi did not actually... It, it wasn't mentioned that Acerbi apologised at any point. That's something that's being yeah. mentioned. Maybe, I don't know maybe he didn't catch the apology yeah. because a football pitch is big and maybe they were a bit yeah. further away. We should have gone to VAR. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they've got the technology to read players' fucking lips nowadays, no? Like, Messi mm-hmm. always has his mouth covered. I'm sure that's because of the yeah. amount of technology um, that there is. Or that or he's an absolute fucking pervert. Yeah. <laughs> <He's just constantly. laughs> Messi is going up to people talking sex the yeah. entire time. I feel the need to mention that in honor of the international break, I am wearing my Malta kit, my retro Malta kit. Arana ma udin, aloba her anin. But yes, Viva Malta. Shout out to any aspiring or current Maltese footballers that are listening to us right now. Shout out to all of you. We are behind you. We love you. Let's do this. Let's fucking Come go. Come on. We need more Teumas in this world. <laughs> yeah. Um, Italy are in the USA at the moment. Uh, yes. The national team. Actually, he's been dropped from the national team. And replaced with um, a figure who isn't controversial at all, right? In Gianluca Mancini. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He's, he's rumored to be going straight into the starting eleven. How does that work? He wasn't even called up. To be honest, starting. man, in a in a back three for Italy, debate for another day. But I really see Mancini fitting in, especially you lose Bonucci and Chiellini. You're not gonna bring that. That's guy what I was gonna say, man. Grinta That's what I game. was gonna say. When you look at the Italian national team, the one thing they're missing is a. Fucking it's dick, an asshole. An asshole. Yes, a, a, a piece of shit, a yes. Bonucci. These it's guys. It's good to have got barellas. Ah, you know, fucking no. Mm. Yeah. So that'll balance that out a little bit. Um, a shout yeah. out to our patrons, by the way. We do have Patreon if you wish to support us. Um, it's three ninety nine a month, and it's what keeps the show going. Um, hopefully, um, if you're seeing this on YouTube, you will have noticed a few significant upgrades. We'll see. Um, time will tell. <laughs> yeah. We have yet to to mess around with it, but we'll we'll see. Um, this is all obviously. This has all been made possible thanks to our patrons, and these are them. There's Alan, Andrew, Andy, Anthony, Tim, Campbell, Sluge, McNoodle, Lena, David, Kyle, Luca, Matthias, Mint, Michael, Ed, and Tonna. Thank you very much, guys. These are the spotheads. These are. Our family members, these are the people who keep the show going. Yeah, and if you haven't got three ninety nine a month to help us grow, then just like our content, drop us a follow wherever you're listening. Subscribe. Subscribe, give us a rating. Um, I do recommend checking us out on YouTube. It's simply a little bit more engaging, gives it a bit more um, mm. of a personal feel. And I don't know about you guys, but when I listen to podcasts, I'm always wondering, what does this guy look like? Or what does this girl look like? So here we are. Jake and Matt Fennec from Malta. Um, hello. Yes. In Selmukom. In Selmukom. The, <laughs> um, the YouTube episode drops a little bit later as yeah. well. So if you're looking for it and you can't find it, it's probably uploading. Mm. It takes it takes. And eons. if you're a video editor that charges absolutely nothing, we're interested. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> yes. we're figuring We'd like this to meet all you. out, man. We really, yeah. really are. Um, before we get into the rundown, so on and so forth, um, the European matches have taken place in the meantime. Um, unfortunately for Italian teams, um, there are no Italian teams left in the Champions League after Napoli crashed out after losing 3-1 to Barcelona and Inter crashed out in their match against Atletico after losing on penalties. That was a very entertaining match, but unfortunately... For every Serie A fan and for Inter fans in particular, it was Lautaro who missed the penalty along with Alexis Sanchez as well. Um, so no more teams over there. However, you know, still in the Europa League, still in the Conference League, here we are. There's Milan Roma. The fixtures have been announced, and that's an all Italian uh, match over there. In good the and Europa bad, League. like it's good and be entertaining. bad. Entertaining, but be good entertaining. and bad because as in one Italian team is definitely progressing, but mm. one Italian team is definitely getting knocked out. Yeah. Like um, speaking of bad, um, Atalanta Liverpool. <laughs> That's yeah. devastating. Yeah, yeah. We'll see what, devastating. what they can do. Maybe Coop Miners puts on an audition because yeah. he's become the latest player to say that it's my dream to play in the Premier mm. League. It's like I've been basking in this mm. sand but now it's time for some rain exactly. <laughs> it's time for some fish and chips I'm, I'm tired of carbonara <laughs> how could you ever say that like, well, no, it's time so for a couple well said, it's tens a of to, millions to play more in the Premier League. Um, Fiorentina in the Conference League drew um, hell, you're going to have to help me out here Victoria Pilsen 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 Pilsen, Pilsen. Yeah. Um, Fiorentina are one of the favourites to go all the way in that competition so let's hope this year they can make it happen because mm-hmm. last year it was quite a disappointing final 
Um, yeah. I, th- I thought they deserved it, but um, West Ham eventually won it. Yeah. yeah, well, their fans won it by beating the living shit out of their players, no? <laughs> um, but let's get into the rundown so we can jump straight into the action. Guys, the first game we're going to be covering is Inter 1, Napoli 1. And those are the champions elect versus the current champions. Some of us forget that Napoli are champions because yeah. they've been really on and off. Um that's another point for Calzona, and that is the first time this season that Inter have conceded in the last 15 minutes of a match. Verona 1, Milan 3, and um, that's where Chukweza got that goal. Milan are actually currently the team in Serie A, which feature the most goals coming off the bench. Um, Pioli subs are shit, Pioli subs are shit, maybe give Pioli good players, and then his subs will be good. Juve nil, Genoa nil, a very frustrating outing for Juve and a clear divide, particularly in Juve's fan base. And the Vlaovic red. Boiled over onto the pitch and Vlaovic did end up getting sent off for telling the ref something about his mother. (laughs) Reported. Um, Empoli nil, Bologna won. The only goal, the opener and the closer was scored in the last minute of that game by young boy Fabian, these midfielders are allowed so much fucking liberty to attack for Bologna, and it was another young midfielder that got a goal over there. Roma won Sassuolo nil. Sassuolo looking significantly cleaner when it comes to defending. They frustrated Roma, but even though Roma didn't have the best outing, they managed the three points. That's what we always say. It's about getting the three points at this stage. Frosinone 2, Lazio 3. Atati Castellanos, Bray saved them from yet more heartache um, but finally Lazio get a hard earned victory over there despite it being Frosinone Frosinone we know that they come out they attack and they make your life hell even if they do fucking split like the the sea that Moses split whenever they're defending um Udinese and nil Torino too. Torino looked absolutely fantastic um, in this game. Super attacking. They had all the chances. Um, but Udinese's goalkeeper, Okoye, had a, so had a good, really, so really good, good game over here, man. Monza won Cagliari nil. The only goal was Daniel Maldini's free kick. Unfortunately for Cagliari, their positive streak comes to an end over there. Salernitana nil. Lecce one is the final game we're going to be covering another relegation six-pointer over there. And once again, Salernitana fail to win that, which has led to Liverani. A little more oh breaking news, Jesus Christ, Liverani oh being goodness. sacked. Yeah. And they bring back Colin Tuono. Can you believe it? The same man who got them promoted originally, to yes. say, a few years back. was it They're preparing for Serie yeah. B, man. But, they have to but be. they had sacked him really unjustly, if yes, you remember. Bro. There was a really sad picture of Colantuono sat on a bench. Like Pablo Escobar, yeah, bro. Like that remember? Pablo Escobar there. photo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can't believe he accepted. And, and I yeah. can't believe before that they were rumoured to be bringing in Pippo and Zaghi again. Who they should have never let go to begin with. And you know, Literally. you listen regularly. Literally. We think about this. Hot and um, cold, man, this team. Hot and yeah. fucking cold. It would have been smart to bring back in Zaghi because he's a Serie B specialist nowadays. Absolutely. So he would have gone straight back up, you know. Yeah, I just hope that in Serie B, Salernitana, you know, they, they pick it up, man, and they get straight back up to Serie A because it's not going to be the fucking same without them. But Absolutely. Without further ado, brother, shall we jump into the happenings? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like you buffered for a bit over there. But let's start with Inter 1, Napoli 1. Both teams had crashed out of Europe um, in the build-up to this match. They both crashed out of the Champions League as the only two Italian teams that remained in the Champions League. Inter were coming off a 1-0 away win against Bologna um, and losing to Atletico Madrid on penalties. West Napoli were coming off a 1-1 draw to Torino and losing 3-1 to Barca. The previous encounter between these two sides was Napoli 0, Inter 1. Inter ended their run of 10 consecutive Serie A victories as Napoli earned a 1-1 draw at San Siro. Victor Ozyman was only fit for the bench with a muscular issue and Zielinski did not start against the side that are going to be his future club. Arnautovic, Carlos Augusto, Quadra- Quadrado and Sensi were still out of action for the hosts. Quadrado <laughs> is one of the funniest things I would have ever said on this podcast, man. 3-5-2 formation for Inter, Summer and Gold, backline of Bastoni, Acerbi, Boo! and Favard. DeMarco on the left, Darmian on the right, and the midfield three of Mkhitaryan, Chalanoglu and Barella with Turam and Martinez up front. 
4-3-3 for Napoli, Merit in goal and the backline of Di Lorenzo, Rahmani, Juan Jesus and Oliveira. Go Juan Jesus, midfield three of Anguissa, Lobotka and Traore once again, with Politano and Gvaratskelia flanking Raspadori. Now captains Lautaro Martinez and Di Lorenzo shook hands in front of a massive keep racism out backdrop and a massive patch mirroring the same phrase on their sleeve, reminding everyone that it only takes a man without balls to revert to racism. Inter threatened Napoli in the 12th minute as Darmian and Lautaro forced Merit into a double save before Barella sent the third attempt into the stands. In the 43rd minute, Bastoni's low cross was finished cleanly by Darmian, who grabbed his second goal of the season and the first of this match. In the 52nd, Di Marco threatened from a free kick routine, where Merit got down well to deny his Italian counterpart. And in the 60th minute, there seemed to be some drama concerning a conversation between Acerbi and Juan Jesus. Jesus could be seen reporting to the referee that Acerbi had called him the N-word. To quote the Italian, centre-back allegedly said, get away from me, you're just an N-word. Turns out we were absolutely wrong. It doesn't take a man without balls to revert to racism. Sometimes it takes just the one. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that absolutely happened. Five minutes later, however, this absolutely turned the tide of Juan Jesus's performance. In the 65th minute, Jesus got a crucial block to deny a Barella goal, keeping Napoli in the game. And in the 81st minute, Juan Jesus scored the winner because racism never fucking wins, what brother. What a reaction, man. Oh, I have to say, Juan Jesus handled this so well. Amazing. He was calm, he was composed, he reported to, to the referee. He didn't lose his head, he didn't... He didn't make a scene when he was well within his rights to make a scene. Absolutely. But he he didn't. He had every right to walk out the same way. Mike Manian walked out the same way. Balotelli walked out the same way all these guys walked out. Exactly. Muntari as well back in the day. And those were were because of the fans. Yeah. Let alone because of a player. A player you're sharing a pitch with. A a colleague at the end of the day. A veteran colleague. Yeah. Yeah. And then he scored, um, which was just crazy. What a reaction. Absolutely, man. Absolutely, and the first time Inter concede um, in the last 15 minutes this season. Now, just to stick onto the topic of um, the incident, there are ongoing investigations by the FIGC Prosecutor's Office. Um, Both players are going to be interviewed and there are potential sanctions. Um, Now, here we go, Article 28, Paragraph 2 of the Code of Sports Justice suggests a minimum 10-match suspension for discriminatory behavior, raising the stakes for Acerbi's future. So there is the possibility that if deemed guilty, Acerbi could be out for at least 10 games. Um, Acerbi has been dropped from the national team by Spalletti for their two upcoming friendlies, replaced by Mancini. Let's see what happens for the Euros. Let's see what happens um, for everything. Kala Fury robbed that, by the way. Absolutely. But for Again, the friendlies, yeah. I find that everyone was telling me, I was mentioning Calafiori, everyone was like, ah, but these are just the friendlies, you know? But th- isn't this the audition? Like, this is, yeah, Isn't this, this where you call up the guys yeah. that you might fucking call up? So you if could it, say yes or okay, no. Okay, if, if Calafiori wasn't called up to the friendlies, it's very unlikely he'll be called up to the Euros. It's as simple as yeah. that. Um, he's versatile man he'd be good the, for the them. problem is there's quite a wide pool of talent there at centre back mm. in Italy um, it's not like the number 9 position or the midfield at the moment because the we midfield's were, going quite we thin we were talking man. about the midfield yeah. last time and we were like it got so much worse since Jorginho fell off and since Verratti moved back to Saudi yeah. it's like okay so Locatelli is a guaranteed starter. Ah, is, no. is that the case? So Pellegrini kind of has to walk in at this point. Ballegri yeah. is the staple there. Barella. Barella. Ballegri is fucking Balle- brilliant, bro. <laughs> Ballegri. Yeah. So Barella is the staple. <laughs> the question is, when is Tonali's suspension up? Does mm. he go back straight into the team, for mm. example? I don't think he'll walk straight into the no, team. For, he needs to and prove himself from the very beginning. For the balance of the team as well. Now, be it a 3-5-2, be it a 4-3-3, you need three midfielders with good balance. You need a regista, you need a track artista, and you need a mezzala. Yeah. And unfortunately, I don't think there is a significant ball-winning midfielder in the team. Um, and the metronome, the regista, lacks a bit of talent. And, and it's literally named an Italian phrase. It is typically yeah. staple, the perfect position for an Italian man to play that and centre-back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, enough about the, the national team. We can record a special for the Euros in summer. We've got a lot to do as well. We do, hopefully. we do. Um, 
to, to move away from that and talk a bit about the game, this is the end of Inter's winning streak. Um, they had 10 consecutive Serie A victories um, before this. So they had the, the bad Champions League um, game where they lost on penalties. Then they drew to Napoli. I know they have won less competition, but could this, including the drama within the team, lead to a slight dip in form for Inter? Absolutely. I mean, this if you look at this game, it was a definition of two teams who are hung over from Champions League elimination, uh-huh. literally. Um, I'm sure Napoli would take this. They'd be very happy with this. Um, Inter, on the other hand, probably not too, not too bothered either because yeah. of the um, comfort they've created for themselves, essentially. Uh-huh. So, yes, both teams, to be honest, are quite demoralized. Um, it was a showcase event you know, where you have some of the brightest um, attackers in Italian football. You've got Lautaro, you've got Thuram, you've got Gvaratskelia. You've got Aussie men, you've yeah, got all these unfortunately guys. Unfortunately, no Aussie men in this one. Uh, but no Aussie men in this one, yeah. That was also very strange because he was on the bench. No, apparently he wasn't 100%. Um, he wasn't 100%. Yeah. Um, ah, so you have all this talent and then the goals come through centre-backs and the yeah. assists as well, which, yeah. is, which is quite crazy. <laughs> mm-hmm. One thing I didn't mention, speaking of centre-backs, is that Juan Jesus, obviously, for those of you that have been watching ball for more than four years, watching Serie for more than four years, you'll remember that Juan Jesus was an Inter player. Um, so I guess double the W for him in this a reward of the Lex goal and also a good a good goal for justice revenge. I think that despite Inter dropping points in this game, I thought they were significantly the better side against <laughs> <Yes>. Napoli. Um, <laughs> but what Napoli did well is preventing them from getting more than one goal, and I think that came as a combination of Napoli being solid defensively relatively solid they they have gotten better defensively to be honest they started getting better defensively under Mazzari mm-hmm. um, for a while and then it kind while, of came yeah, yeah yeah um but also i felt that inter were pretty wasteful man absolutely i mean they had 19 shots in total um mm. only six of them on target uh, not exactly great um, and yeah. they did miss quite a few opportunities um, they're quite short on confidence, you know. I mean, Thuram will still be thinking about that miss against Atletico, mm. for example. Um, Lautaro will still be thinking about that penalty miss yeah. and how the ball mysteriously levitated, you know, mm. and all that stuff. So, so yeah, naturally, this was the the way it was. It was mm-hmm. always gonna go, you know. They're yeah. gonna need to smash a team three 0 to get their confidence back up. Yeah. So even even when by fine margins, that'll get them back right mm-hmm. on track. I think where Napoli kind of turned the tide in the game is towards the latter stages, let's say from um, like in the in the second half, one thing that Napoli did in an attempt to get the equaliser, so obviously they brought on Mario Rui for the crosses, so on and so forth, they made good changes, um, but also they increased their press on mm-hmm. Inter and particularly around Chalanoglu as the number six playing the ball around, they were... Even, you know how the defenders typically control the game, that, mm. that back three, particularly Bastoni, so on and so forth. They were really pressing them, and we forget that, okay, if you press Inter, you really run the risk of them breaking through, because they are quick, sharp, and direct. But also, at times, and we've seen this happen even last season with Brozovic, and even this season with Chalanoglu, we do see that if you press them... Sometimes mm, they're vulnerable. They can give the ball away. Uh-huh. It, it can not happen. A, an incredibly press resistant yeah. team. They're they dominant, were, but not press resistant. They were definitely more press resistant, I feel, under Brozovic. Yeah. Um, now I feel like they they can be very good. Of course, one of the strengths of the Sinter team is actually evading the press. Mm. Um, however, yes, they, they obviously can be caught out, um, especially when you look at Chalanoglu, who does have a mistake in him every now and then. Who does kind of pass it waywardly? Yeah, um, yeah. So might as well press them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and with um, with I forgot the Napoli manager's name for a second. Calzone. Yeah, Calzone. Yes. Damn, I'm hungry. <laughs> um, with Calzone, you know they're they're playing that pressing system again, the the same Spalletti system. So so that's what it's all focused around. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's it for this game. Unless you have anything else that you want to bring up, um, I hate it when. Most of the talking points are taken up by disgusting things that happen yeah. on the pitch, but unfortunately, <laughs> that's the way that this game went. That was the breaking news. Um, breaking news is also that, obviously, Inter's 10-game winning streak has 
come to an end. Finally, no more WWW next to each other, but there's a D at the end of it. They are still in first place, but only 14 points ahead of second place Milan, whilst Napoli are in seventh place on 45 points. They're nine points behind fourth place Bologna. So a lot of work to do if they want to get European football, well, if they want to get Champions League. Yeah, absolutely. Still, still quite a way to go. Yeah. Um, Milan took on Verona away from home. Um, and Verona lined up with Montepo in goal. They had a back four of... <laughs> Fabien Centonce, Coppola, <laughs> Davidovic and Juan Cabal. With Duda and Serdar as the double pivot. With Suslov and Lazovic playing out wide. With Michael Folorunshaw playing behind Tiani Noslin. What was that team last year? Cremonese had an absolute... Oh my god. Oh my god. La- god Lacosvili. Lacosvili. Yeah. Pekel. Pekel was fine, but Lacosvili was crazy, man. So many weird names in that team. Yeah. Uh, Milan, on the other hand, lined up in their 4-2-3-1 formation with Manian in goal. Theo on the left, Calabria on the right. With Tomori and Kalulu as a centre-back pairing. With Reinders and Benasser in the double pivot. Leao and Pulisic out wide with Okafor playing up front and Loftus Cheek playing in the pocket behind him. I feel like interesting to note over here that um, Okafor started over Jovic for yeah. the first time in a while. Go on. Yeah. Um, I, it's funny how the staple centre back is Tomori, and on the other hand, it seems like the others are auditioning at the uh-huh, moment. Uh-huh. So Kalulu, Kier, Gabbia. At times, Theo, they're, they're all popping in next to him. See how it goes. Kalulu's having a nightmare this season when it comes to his fitness, man. He went off in the 46 minutes as yeah. well. And you saw, um, they, they asked him, how do you feel now? They interviewed him after he recovered from, from injury. And he was like, cento per cento. Yeah. Cento yeah. per so cento. <laughs> yeah, he said he thought about quitting for a while when he was at his worst. Madonna. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, Milan came out firing and they hit the post twice through Pulisic and Okafor. Um, Okafor's was, uh, wasn't, it didn't hit the post actually, it was a remarkable save. I thought it hit the okay. post originally, but it was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant save by Montepo, who, um, who does have a good save in him. Yeah, man. Um, the first goal for Milan came th- in the 44th minute when Theo kept trying to square it to a teammate. He tried mm. once and bounced back to him. He tried again and bounced back to him. Suddenly he's in front of the goalkeeper. And he just fires it and past Montepo. And then he runs up, he does his trademark celebration. Yeah, the, um, the, I don't know. Yeah, which he's been doing for a while. And if you look up photographic evidence, you'll find out that Theo has been doing this before Di Marco. So for anyone who's saying that Theo's copying Di Marco, that's not the case at all. <laughs> um, it also is not the it case... It was a petty like, it, kind of argument. He wasn't doing it he, first, he okay? He wasn't, all right? He wasn't copying Di Marco, guys, okay? <laughs> He's been doing it for ages, actually. DeMarco copied him. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Um, even though the timing was was so sweet with Inter just getting um, eliminated from the uh, Champions League and Theo running to the camera and going... Uh, <laughs> uh, well, he did. He did. Yeah, he did put a bit more of yeah. a bounce. In he got a yellow card for it. Um, the referees saw it as provocative That's towards so the opposition fans. And um, he'll be missing the Fiorentina game now. That's Theo and, and the, the manager... Verona's manager, who initially reported that to the referee, saw after the game that that's Theo's celebration, and he apologized. Now, the apology, <laughs> like, cheers, brother, for the apology, it doesn't change anything, but at least, you know, like, like um, a genuine dude, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, At least he can admit he was wrong, yeah. like most officials in this Marco league. Baroni. Ah, God, I thought... <laughs> never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, in the 50th minute in the second half, Okafor's high press won the ball back for Milan. He charged and forced Montepo into a save and Pulisic was there to tap in the rebound. Um, it seemed to be job over, job done for Milan. Um, however, in the 65th minute, Tiani Noslin unleashed a rocket because, of course, Milan have to concede. And uh, it went past Mike Manian. It was quite an unstoppable strike, to be honest, by Noslin, who's hit the ground running ever since mm. coming to replace Juric. More than Zvederski. More than, I mean, there's no, no Noslin's on two, Zvederski's on one. So mm. uh, technically, they've got three goals out of the replacement of Juric, which for a relegation battling side is decent, mm. you know. And I mean, how many does Juric have for Monza? Absolutely none. None. Yeah. And then in the 79th minute, super sub Samuel Chukwes uh, scored a lovely volley um, to get his first goal in Serie A. Mm. Yeah, that 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 goal put a smile to everyone's face, man. I like seeing Chukwueze happy. I like seeing him thriving. 
Absolutely, man. Um, Leo, Mr. Massive Opportunity, in the 70th minute when he did everything perfectly. Now, Leo seems to be back at his best, in mm. my in my opinion. Um, however, in front of goal, he's still not totally sharp um, uh-huh. yet. There was a time last season where it seemed to be a given that he would slot that coolly past yeah. the goalkeeper. However, now he is a little bit in his head when it comes to his finishing. I think the criticism must have got them to a certain extent you know i mean how many times you're going to read the same things and we know that leo is a person who's active on socials he's always liking things and retweet retweeting yeah. things yeah um so so yeah i'm sure that his confidence has been has been affected it's clear to see i mean definitely i think one thing that um he has gotten back to i i'm not sure if it's down to confidence because when it comes to confidence he really is inserting himself in those situations. I feel like even through making those more central runs, allowing Okafor to drift and just like mm-hmm. stunning the defenders, like he doesn't mind putting himself in those situations. And he, it's not a matter of him being stuck be- between two minds or anything like that. He hits it. He's 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 there. Like it's just he's he's not accurate um, in those situations yet. Yeah. Yet he's not he's not accurate in those situations. Yet he's Leo is not a clean finisher. Um, he has had he great. Has been. He has had great runs of form where finishing which was never his strong point. But but he he would slot them in that goal against Inter. I remember from quite a tight angle mm. after beating one of the players down to his ass. I forgot who yeah. it was. I think I think it was Dev De 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 I, De um, I can't remember. But. I, I don't know. I think he's getting more confident. Just on your point of that he's on social media a lot. I, I think that he's one of those people. Um, um, unfortunately, I think he's one of those people that wants just to prove people wrong. Mm. You see when a player... Dusan Vlavic is another one. You see that when players go through a long streak of not finding the net and then they finally score... Um, you could tell by their celebration. There are the humble players that, like, you could see them take a breath and smile at their teammates yeah. and celebrate with their teammates. Like, yes, finally, man. Like, this weight is off my shoulder. You guys know how much I struggled. Like, let's share this moment. Like, yeah. wow, what a weight off my shoulders. And then there's Vlaovic spamming triangle, square, circle, and X after he scores. <laughs> is doing every single fucking celebration. Leo, when when he scores, the, the first thing he does is either a, a, a show shore or everyone's talking. Yeah, everyone's talking. talking. Yeah. It's like. I don't know when when people exercise that kind of behavior after scoring goal. It's like, how much are you doing this for you, and how much are you doing it to to kill the critics? I think some of the greatest of all time have had that mentality, though. Um, I guess as, chip on their shoulder. Exactly, and that can be used as fuel, as long as he uses that as fuel and not as anything else. Then, then I think it can be very good for him. I mean, uh-huh. think of one of the greatest of all time in Cristiano Ronaldo. He was he would be the first. Cristiano Ronaldo is the pettiest of them all when it comes to this stuff. <laughs> Cristiano Ronaldo was once, I think it was the United fans who were saying that he had gained weight or something. Really? He, they had said he gained weight or he wasn't in, in great shape or he was unfit, something like that, before they played Juve. Mm. Something, or, I, I don't know, I think it was Juve. Yeah. And then they, they came against each other in the Champions League and Ronaldo scored. Mm. You remember he ran to the fans, he took off his shirt and he ah, flexed his abs like ah, flex, like look at this like ah, you call this out of shape. What you know? he did with Juve against Atletico, <laughs> he imitated Cholito. Yeah, um, th- many things. I think you have to have a bit of that. Um, the difference is none of these guys are Cristiano Ronaldo. You know, I I I'm a firm believer that whatever gives you good form, fucking exercise it, do it your best. But obviously, then there's something sustainable and healthy, and then there's something that's not sustainable and something that can keep digging that hole deeper and deeper and deeper if you keep trying just to prove people wrong now these are elite athletes i'm not gonna fucking give them yeah. advice so I'll, I'll i'll end my point there <laughs> <laughs> yeah um fair enough bro now this was quite a tough hellas verona team to break down and um, we highlighted their goal difference um in the last episode saying that it's definitely by far the best one in the bottom yeah. 15 and the bottom five sorry in um, in Serie A. So this was quite a, a a tough game for Milan, but they handled it pretty cool and, and they didn't seem to be under any pressure throughout the majority of the game. Uh-huh. Um, I liked seeing Okafor over there in that position. Um, apparently, it was time to try it out because Jovic as a starter simply hasn't been working. 
off the bench he's changed games for Milan but as a starter um, I don't think he's done anything yet as a starter this season yeah. apart from getting a red card in that one time uh-huh. no but what you get from Okafor as well is a, is a quick start good tempo mm-hmm. from the get go the That's way he's chasing well, every too. ball down um, which typically isn't something we all know the qualities that players like Juro and Jovic bring to the game um, which is linking up with the midfield playing with their back towards goal but having someone absolutely pressing the shit out of and, and as well Leao is quite chill when it comes to the press so having Okafor yeah. absolutely running rampant chasing everyone up there made a world of a difference I thought it worked well going into the season we both thought that that was going to be plan A yeah, option yeah, I thought A so. I thought so yeah um, I thought it was going to be a dynamic trio, but of course, Giroud has been on another level and his skill set really complements these guys. Yeah. It's a shame he's not mm. as, as mobile or as young anymore. And apparently, he's off to the MLS, bro. Mm. I think he's it's done his. Not, uh, it's not confirmed, but he seems very interested uh, in it. He's been flirting with it for a while, huh? the move, saying he, uh, it interests him. Mm. Um, I think that leaving on a high sometimes is, is good. He's no spring chicken, au mm. contraire. He's an ancient chicken. <laughs> he's 37 <laughs> years old, you know. I mean, he's having his probably one of his best ever seasons this year. Might as well end it over here, you know, before mm. it goes tits up. So you remember it as a hero. This guy came to Milan. He had his, one of his best ever seasons. He won Milan the league. That's that's good enough. This is our Giroud bobblehead. And for those of you that can't see, no, 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 no. This is the Giroud bobblehead. This is a glass ah. of red wine because he ages like wine. And... To be honest, change is good. I'm going to miss the fucking shit out of Giroud forever, an icon of Milan, but change is good at times. It's good for him. It's probably good for Milan because they can put more focus in bettering that area. Sometimes you settle for good when you should take it up to excellent. Yeah. Um, And I think that's what Milan are looking to do. There are fucking four names that are being mentioned apparently Milan want to make two heavy investments man there's Sesco being mentioned there's Zegze being mentioned there's Mm. a bunch of guys Mm. now apparently speaking of the transfer market and rumours allegedly Mike Manian is asking now again this has already come out before and then went quiet a little bit Mm. now it's come out again that Manian wants the same salary as Leao who Mm. is one of Milan's highest earners and who has been there for who is Milan's highest earner and then it's Leao after him and he's mm-hmm. exactly who's been there for five years as well very important to mention what do you think about that man because i'm seeing people online saying ah you have to give it to him you have to you have to give money on um what he's asking for i disagree i disagree as well i'm gonna think of this through the lens of of a guy with a podcast totally neutral like not mm. not not a milan fan right of course and um, we think about as everything. But as a Milan fan, it pisses me off, right? As a Milan fan, it angers me because you've been there two years, three years rather. Um, first season, fantastic, one Milan the league, saving penalties, fucking Portier Attaccante, being, just being fucking Magic Mike, you know? Then started the injuries, man. Started the injuries and then started the attitude. I then started this whole fucking, oh, look at me, look at me, look at me kind of mentality. And then starts asking for money. So it was just from absolute hero. I feel like all he has done from season one is regressed. He regressed from season one up until this point. He is now this season, apart from being one of the best goalkeepers in the world, he is conceding at his near post at Mm, times. He's going off injured. I, mean, I am more than more than regressing. Sorry, to interrupt you. that's okay. That's um, okay. More than regressing, I think it's he isn't the flawless goalkeeper that we had, that Milan had in the first season. Yeah, yeah. It's as simple as he's showing. Yeah, his, I mean, his, I, I obviously his, mean his form yeah. is regressing, not not his, his vulnerabilities. Qualities. He's showing that, for example, he does have his weaknesses. That at mm. his near post, there's no way he's top five in the world. For example, yeah. when it comes to getting down. And saving shots at his near post because he's been beaten way too many times mm. at his near post this season. The injuries are ridiculous. How can you they're demand mental, that salary mental. when a team can't rely on you for 38 games a season? It you know worries I mean? me, man, because he's a goalkeeper. Yeah, exactly. Imagine he was an outfield player, he'd be fucked. He wouldn't have a career. Yeah, like, most keepers, so they often. play the full season. They mm-hmm. miss a game or two with injury, uh-huh. you know. But, but being so injury prone is bizarre mm-hmm. as a goalkeeper. Bro, a hundred million... Which, which is fuck between 70 to 100 is being mentioned 
like just ridiculous numbers. Inflation is fucking real. Like, there's no way you sell manyan for a hundred million. Like, the thing is, man, that ever since this whole Milan project has started and they started buying young, the money ball movement, as mm. they call it, mm. um, Milan have have really invested wisely. And suddenly, out of nowhere, they have players in their team that they could have never dreamt of having five years ago. Yeah. You could, you could never acquire Leao as he is nowadays no. as Milan. You could have never acquired Tomori as he is nowadays at Milan. Theo the same, Manian the same. You buy these people before they explode. Good scouting network, you know. I forgot his name, the scout of uh, Milan. And there's a very good... Ah, uh, uh, jo- fucking Jonah Hill, bro. <laughs> yeah, Jonah Hill and Moneyball. Forgot his name. I forgot his um, name. I can see his face right now so yeah. clearly. Like he's got like young guy. spiky hair. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but yes, they invested very very intelligently, and now they've got these players who they afford to flip and do the same thing again. So in two three years time, you have another three players yeah. who are exactly the same, and suddenly yeah. your whole squad is full of mm-hmm. stars. This is a very 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 intelligent way of investing, and even Benasser. Was yeah. acquired for like 12 million after winning MVP at AFCON. Are literally, you mad? Literally, yeah. literally. No, with, with, again, just to go back directly to, to Manian, like, obviously, he's, he's a fantastic goalkeeper, one of the best in the world. But when it comes to negotiations, brother, you've chosen the wrong season to ask for such a high fucking wage. That's it. If you look at the three years, is he warranted to have one of the best wages in the team? Probably, probably. But the season has been a, a completely different story and to be so harsh in your negotiation with the team when you know damn well that you've been struggling with injuries. There was a time last season, bro, he was out for fucking months, like, for months. And all you can ask for your goalkeeper, all you can ask, bro, is to be available 24 sevens for your number one keeper, to be available and fit for every single game. And unfortunately, yeah. can't guarantee that. So 70 million, <coughs> enjoy. In the Scudetto winning season, I forgot that Rosano had to save Lautaro's penalty as well. Yes, bro. Yes. Yeah, so yes. Been, <laughs> and then the second season, so he couldn't save anything because yeah. he had an astigmatism. The poor <laughs> guy with a 39 year old Tatar Rosano with an astigmatism. He did the operation at 39. <laughs> and bro, are you mad? Like, I've got an astigmatism and I struggle. Nowadays, bro, I've just got new glasses and. Do till I got used to these things. I'd throw a paper into a bin and I'd just miss completely. <laughs> it'd land right next. I was always like good at that shit, you mm. know. And it's, I'm like, damn, I'm aging, man. Yeah. I don't know how Tatarzano was a professional goalkeeper with his astigmatism. I'm man. a fucking leopard, bro. But yeah, you're a leopard with my eyesight. Like, I'm uh, crazy, man. You're 2020, bro. Mental, like, first time you ever got full marks, huh? <laughs> 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 Las Verona are down in 15th with 26 points. I'm sure they'll be they'll be happy with that. You know, I mean, it's it's Milan at the end of the day yeah. who are up in second with 62 points. Juve nil, Genoa nil. Another bad result for Juve, to put it quite frankly. Um, Juve coming off a 2-2 draw to Atalanta, whereas Genoa coming off a 3-2 home loss to Monza. Um, the previous encounter was a 1-1 draw between these two teams, so Juve have not managed to beat Genoa this season. Woof. Juve had <laughs> woof, woof. Juve had Vlaovic back from suspension and Rabiot on the bench after, a dislo- after coming back from a dislocated toe. Though Milik and Alcaraz suffered muscular problems. The Griffone missed Aaron Martin, Alan M- Maturo, I always fucked that up, and banned Stefano Sabelli following back to back defeats, but gave Vitinha his first start. I like this Vitinha guy, man. Mm-hmm. 3 5 2 formation for Allegri's men, Chesney in goal, and the back line of Danilo, Bremer, and Gatti. Kostic on the left, Cambiaso on the right, and the midfield three of Miretti, Locatelli, and McKenny, with Vlaovic and Chiesa starting up front together. 3 4 to 1 for Genoa, Gilardino's men with Martinez in goal and the backline of De Winter, Barney and Vasquez. Spence on the right, Messias on the left and a uh, double pivot of Badel and Frendrup with Vitinha and Goodmanson playing behind Retegui. Now, the first half, I mean nothing really to write home about Juve. Um, Genoa did start off bringing the game to Juve, but the game was majority. The majority was um, being controlled by Juve. They were attacking. They were going forward. Um, 
but the action really took place in the slow action game in the second half. Uh, in the 66th minute, Elling Jr. took a low strike from outside the air, which, which struck the outside of the post. Two minutes later, in the 68th, Juve scraped the frame of the goal through a great header by Vlaovic. In the 74th, Vlaovic again had an opportunity with a header, but missed an absolute sitter as he misjudged the flight of the ball and failed to hit the target. Moise Keane hit the post in the 89th with a low strike into the near post, so that's twice that Juve hit the post over there. And the 92nd minute, Vlaovic was sent off for a descent after only just returning from suspension. That's one thing we forget. Um... The first thing I want to talk about is something very interesting between um, the ultras and the fans, right? Mm. In the Juve Stadium, it's very, very interesting. Juventus' ultras in Curva Sud chanted Allegri's name right after kickoff. But the rest of the fans in the other sections of the stadium booed the Curva. Yeah, it's a civil war. For doing so. Juve's ultras hit back after the halftime whistle, when most supporters booed the players rather than supporting them. At that point, Juve's ultras insulted the other fans by chanting, the translation is a bit off, you are a shitty public. Mm. Supporters in the Curva Sud kept supporting the team for the entire match, but appeared to be asking for clarification from players after the final whistle. So, it's the same thing you see with every team, you know, um, Curva ride or die you know they're 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 the level-headed ones they're the super fans and 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 they keep it professional throughout their part of the team and then there are the bit more casuals you know it's not it's not their life yeah you know they they go when they can um it's just interesting to see this very clear divide like which side are you essentially are you essentially on? I think that when it comes to the the Juve ultras and their stance, it's mostly romantic, simply because of the fact that Allegri has had so much success with Juventus mm. historically, right? Um, this season, Allegri started off perfectly fine. You know, um, he was competing for the Scudetto for for the majority of the season. Mm-hmm. Um, it was only. To, after the head-to-head against Inter, that they yeah. were really out of the out of the title race, um, I think that the, the fans, the hardcore fans, showing solidarity with Allegri is sweet. Mm-hmm. Um, the public booing him, I think that's kind of unnecessary at this point. You know, you've got a team right now who are trying their best, trying their best, who are trying to to cement top four. And they need your support. You know, they tried. They tried to go all the way this season. They actually gave it their all, but clearly they fell short, man. And they weren't yeah. quite talented enough. Um, it is the case that okay, Juve haven't decided if they're going to move away from Allegri or not. That hasn't been decided. Is it, is it not? It hasn't been decided. It's not confirmed apparently. However, they're leaning more like like the the mood is more that they they will be parting ways with mm-hmm. Allegri. Um, The first piece of evidence for this was the acquisition of Napoli's sporting director, Giuntoli. Mm -hmm. Because Giuntoli has some very interesting ideas for Juve and the future. And I think Allegri is not one of them, quite frankly. Um, It goes against his his philosophy. I think he wants a more modern offensive approach, right? Mm. Um, uh I think don't, don't boo him. Support uh-huh. the team and then push for it in summer. Push for if you want to change yeah. protest like, when the season's over. That that's know? my point. Yeah. Like, what the hell do you want them to do now? If you boo them, what do you think that's gonna fucking get you a victory? Um, isn't that what you all want? All thousands of you. Um, Allegri during the game displayed visible frustration uh, mm-hmm. during and after the match. Um, emphasizing his discontent with the team's performance and the tactical execution. One thing that there is, is Allegri does not believe that the players are carrying out Allegri's tactics in the correct manner. So what they're doing on the training pitch subsequently isn't being mirrored um, on the big stage, on the football pitch. But he seemed particularly displeased with Chiesa. And this wasn't Mm. the first time. He even mentioned in the press conference that he had to reply to somebody who wanted to replace the coach. Mm. Um, and, and everyone is saying that it's Chiesa, right? But clearly, the divide is that there's the ultras and the fans, there's the team and the coach. It's bad that you There's Vlaovic and the ref. Like. It wasn't even this bad when the whole points deduction thing yeah. came out. They were, they were more united. That kind of united them, you mm-hmm. know? 
um yeah this is this is weird man this is a post title push um collapse essentially yeah. and and uh, um, thankfully they they have that safety net of the points they managed to pick up earlier on the season mm-hmm. but you look at the statistics there and even you watch you play man it leaves so much to be desired man one Because shot their on wings are snipped with all one shot on target in the first half one shot on target in the second half oh good man that's you that, that was Juve's game okay um granted they less is more <laughs> um allegri brought on Ilin junior and keen and I, and they both hit the post yeah um, yeah granted keen was offside keen by the way is another one we, we spoke about Kalu, Kalu, who's having a nightmare this year keen is having the worst season the the, mo- the unluckiest season of his life it's crazy he either It's hits so the post or scores offside every single fucking game and the offside call earlier this season bro, but this much was bro. one of the tightest that we've ever was seen. the first time that i ever disagreed with var i think Yeah. The first I disagreed with VAR was that call. Um, but speaking of absolute fucking nincompoops, speaking of the fans, speaking of um, Allegri, so on and so forth, Vlaovic. All right, you happy, bro, that you call the referee a mean word because you weren't playing well and your teammates aren't playing well and they can't stick to the great philosophist t- tactics during the game. You called him a motherfucker, you did whatever you had to do, and now you're missing lots. You how good, a really big game for Juve in this devastating run of poor form. And now they have to play Lazio, or have a chip on their shoulder without Dusan Vlaovic. And that will be two doors first game in charge. Yep. So, so yeah. Um, Lazio win or draw. Lazio win or draw. <laughs> Lazio win or draw. See, our spotlight slips. Um, uh, uh, Vlaovic... <laughs> A few episodes ago, I praised the fact that he's so resilient when it mm. comes to, you know, just missing and missing and missing, and he keeps mm. trying. This game, he was a petulant child, bro. Mm. That's what he was. That's what he was. He a petulant child with a petulant perm. Flailing his arms around, complaining. Mm. The, the mood the is bad. Of, the mood the is bad. Of, the type of guy, man. When, when, in, off, you'll have a long day at work. You don't even have time to go home. You've got your football shoes in the car. You have a five-a-side right after work, right? Uh-huh. You get in your car. You go to your bloody five-a-side. You've had a terrible day. You just want to unwind. There's a person you've never seen before in your life. <laughs> he's on your team and he's the worst. That, that's what it was like. <laughs> what you love, which, you know? <laughs> like, he's just complaining, demanding the ball. Oh, why didn't you pass? Why did you shoot? You know, every day questioning everything. No, man. This was... This wasn't... Um, A good no, it uh, looks like you're watching a free for all. It's, it's like a free for all 11 men who, yeah. again, a, a manager like Allegri, and we saw Roma with Mourinho. You see what happens when they get given their wings back. Sorry to, mm. be, to really be fucking weird about this, talking about their wings and how Same. they're gone and they're back. But pragmatic coaches are a thing save them for the bottom part of the table or for a recovering fucking football team but for a team bro with Yildiz Chiesa Rabio Vlaovic Cambiazo and these kind of guys you give them Allegri you take their wangs that that's 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 what happens <laughs> can you imagine can you imagine them with a, a, an offensive pressing manager how much more devastating they would be they can't score they've got so much talent and they're really really struggling for mm-hmm. goals bro Juve I think are having apart from Salernitana at the moment form wise <laughs> one of the worst teams at the moment form the most devastating run in the league man mm-hmm. most devastating run and they do need to change things around in summer but booing now isn't the solution another interesting observation i had from this game did you notice that they kind of you've kind of shifted to a to a back four in the second half and and gatti was playing mm, up wide yes. crossing the yes. ball in gatti six foot five gatti crossing the, the ball the guy the that box. we've seen him at the end of these late winners man yeah who plays like he's wearing timberland sometimes you know like <laughs> literally man like what's he doing on the wing crossing the ball i don't know it's it's, it's just a mess at the moment this, this yeah. Juve team. absolutely well they are now down in third and they're three points behind milan now who are in mm. second um whilst genoa <laughs> mm. 
are in 12th on 34 points. Two things I want to tell you before. Actually, one thing. We already mentioned okay. one. Um, Alcaraz, who's injured at the moment. Uh-huh, uh-huh. He's been brought in from Southampton, right? Yes. On a loan with option to buy. An option and to buy for a gazillion for, euros. For 50 million euros. <laughs> for 50 euros. For 50 euros. Huh? <laughs> for 50 million euros, right? Um, first of all, that's already ridiculous. Uh-huh. Because how are you going to decide if someone's worth 50 million <laughs> euros in, in 12 games, 15 games? Uh, uh, and now he's injured, so what the hell are they going to do? But apparently, they might get an extension if Southampton don't get promoted. Now, I don't know oh, where they stand, God. but it's not a guarantee mm. that Southampton will get promoted. So Alcaraz might have some more time to prove his worth. Aha, uh-huh, that's um, good. At Juventus. That's good. Um, what was I going to say? You know, when I used to use that tactic, there was this one FIFA, bro. You know you know me, I'm a manager mode boy, bro. Now, nowadays, I'm all about the team, but at heart, we are manager mode boys. You know, taking fucking Northampton up boy, to the friend. Prem. Um, that's what we used to do with our free time, bro. It was mental. Um, but what I used to do is get fucking Northampton or whatever. Who are you going to buy? Messi. You can't get Messi. Watch me. <laughs> Watch me. <laughs> Loan for a season or two seasons, I think, just for a season. Option to buy nine 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 nine. And at that time, it wasn't advanced enough for the board to tell you like, yo, like we, we don't have those funds. So Barca would just be like nine 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 nine. Take him, yeah, take him. And I used to get, I, I used to get all the stars yeah. like like that. That's that's fucking incredible. Thank you, bro. You're um, incredible. On another note, mm. at the moment, Malta are playing a friendly against Slovenia. The mighty Maltese are playing against um, Kurtic, Jasmine Kurtic, formerly of Parma, and Jaka Biol of Udinese. Benjamin and Sesko. Jan, Benjamin Sesko and Jano blocking goal, and Malta are winning 2-1. Aranama Odin. We've, we've put two past the block, bro. There you go. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Lautaro Martinez. <laughs> Who scored, bro? Who scored? Genuinely? Who scored? Dot com. Um, <laughs> I just closed it. One sec. Let's see. Um, Stephen Pisani and Matthew Gulaimir. <laughs> Fucking Gulli. Yes, Ostia. Come on, boys. Legends. Come on. The next game I feel the need to cover, bro, is Empoli Bologna. Mm-hmm. Right? Now let's take a look at the lineups. We have Caprile in goal for Empoli, the phenomenal Caprile. He's been playing so well this yeah, season. Yeah, he really has been, man. 3 4 2 1 formation for them with Berzinski, Valukovic, and Luperto at the back. Jazzy on the right, Petzella on the left, Male and Marin in the middle, with Zurkovsky and Kambiagi playing behind Niango. For. Bologna, it was a 4-3-3 formation with Skorupski in goal, Beukema on the right, Christensen on the left, Kalafur and Lukumi as the centre-back partners, with Urbanski, Freuler and Ferguson playing as a midfield three, Salamakers on the left, Ndoye on the right and Odgaard up front. Now, this was kind of a test for Bologna because Zergzi did fall injured, as we discussed in the previous episode. Mm-hmm. And they had to see if they had what it takes to get it done without him. Odegaard stepped up, who I must say, not bad. All right. Not bad. All pretty, right. pretty interesting player. Nice yeah. touch. Physical. Mm-hmm. Quite technical. He fits, he fits what they're looking for yeah. in that position. Yeah. I was quite impressed by him. Um, however, they did struggle to score. Um, and it took a very, very late winner. In the 93rd minute, when all hope had been pretty much diminished. Giovanni Fabian stepped up for what, what's that man? How many has he scored this season? Because he he hasn't stopped. It feels like the boy is on loan from Inter, and he once again scored the winning goal for Bologna. And the scenes were just beautiful. You know, you can tell at the moment now they're just thinking of it like we've got ten games to cement this top four spot. Yeah, you know, we've got a little bit of a safety net ever so slightly. We can mess up once, but we need to win. And you can see that. that at that moment when Fabian scored, you can see that the collective mood was like nine to go. As a, it's it's amazing, man, to see what these guys. It really doing. is. I went to a, a restaurant this weekend, um, and the the owners from Bologna. Mm. You know me. I obviously fucking hit them with the Bologna this season, bello, and the, <laughs> the people from Bologna firmly believe, my friend, we have the 
worst that I've actually ever the best team in Europe. One of the best team with the best manager with the best striker. <laughs> They're so confident this season. And it's good to see them like that. They went through some hardships, man. They're lest we forget. Their manager fucking died, man. Yeah, yeah, Their yeah. manager had died. Like it, it was, it was devastating. And the one of the worst parts about that is it complicated everything because in an ideal world they would have parted ways with Mihailovic with yeah. the way things were going. But because of his situation, it just made things more complicated. And, yeah, and they kept them on board. You know, what a club they in that had, sense. What, what amazing, absolute... amazing. But they have a, they had a team even at the time, man. A very interesting team of young, talented players. Many different nationalities, mm. uh, an international team, you know, with, with many many talents, and it's still the case huh, nowadays. Yeah. yeah, they are uh, a very interesting team, very dynamic. They did struggle to create clear cut chances this game, and at the end of the goal is just hilarious. Calafiori, who had been defending all game, was just like, "I have had <laughs> enough." Like, he won the ball back, he cunted it forward into the goalkeeper. The goalkeeper spilt it, and it fell to Fabian there was a good understanding there between mm. the players because there were like three around the ball huh? many many players wanted to hit that but um, they let Fabian have it because he was in the best position and of course the kid is so cool under pressure man mm. I'm freaking out a bit because I'm, I'm noticing a lack of 272 hmm. in this for- no no it is a 272 Actually, because because Ferguson and Urbanski are center mids, yeah. they'd be narrow in the middle in that sense. So yeah, it's still a two four two. Oh, it's still a two seven two. <laughs> Everything is a two seven two. Everything. With Motta. Everywhere you look, two seven two. <laughs> exactly. Um, and Poli, to be honest, I think we're we would have been happy with the draw. They were playing to kind of get something off the counter. Um, the front three kind of did pro- did give them the outlet to do so. But at the end of the day, they had one shot on target and 29% ball position. This was thoroughly deserved by Bologna, who had an XG of 2.42 if you're about that life. Madonna. Yeah, with nine shots on goal, by the way. Caprillo was just pulling saves out of his ass. Yeah, they're on a bit of a, a negative run, Empoli. It all started, right? They, they, they were on such a good streak um, after they won their first game against Monza. Three goals to nil under Davide Nicola. They drew to Juve, they drew to Genoa, they killed Salernitana and got Pippo sacked. <laughs> they <coughs> held Fiorentina and the Derby. They beat Sassuolo 3-2 away from home. Now they lost 1-0 for three matches in a row. Now these matches were Cagliari at home, mm. Milan away and Bologna home. So a relegation six-pointer and two very tough matches. But what where's your where's your head at when it comes to Empoli? They've got positive, uh, negative. They've got a tough running coming up, but they boy do they have the coach to to guide them. Huh? Mm. Um, I don't know if that will be enough. Actually, um, honestly, I, I they've got I a tough difficult. run until the end of the season, they right? Because it's Inter next. It, so it's Inter, Torino, Lecce, okay. Napoli, Atalanta, Frosinone, Lazio, Udinese, Roma. It's in their hands. It's in, they, they have a tough run in coming up, but they have two games there that they can win. There's yeah. the Lecce game, that's going to be crucial. The Udinese game is a crucial one. Frosinone. And Frosinone, they've got three chances. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think they'll be okay. And maybe they can do something against Torino. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Who knows? But it's become more complicated now. I would say Swallow, um, essentially... Um, shutting thing, shutting shop at the back. Yeah, um, it's interesting, man. I think Frosinone are done for. That, that's that's it. I think I've been saying this for a while. I think Frosinone are I down. Think... Salernitana, Frosinone, and then mm-hmm. we'll see either Empoli, either Cagliari, mm-hmm. um, probably one of them too. To be honest, bro. Yeah, because I can't see Udinese, Lecture, Verona going down at this point. Verona, Swallow, but but I what well, I've learned, right? And and I'm just thinking, think. The season, the season, the season, the season, Sassuolo, they're on their third manager, okay, one of them was a caretaker, let's say they're on their, their second manager, but 29 matches in and they're still on 23 points. F- fucking Lecce, still on 28, Udinese, still on 27, Verona, still on 26, Cagliari, still on 26, no matter what, all these teams can still get relegated. I don't see any of these teams as Absolutely. ones that are guaranteed. Like, like I wouldn't even say like 
Sassuolo obviously have a better team and a better track record than any of these teams that they're up against. Fucking, they were in Europe four years ago, whatever it was, five years ago. Um, but the season is the season. This could be the season that one of the fucking mid-table teams goes, goes down. down no. And I'm, I'm not totally, totally against the idea of Sassuolo getting relegated. No. Like, I think it can happen. Ah, no, it, it can happen. It's just difficult because they they look they, they look defensively solid mm. for the first time in a while. And if you get that team to be solid defensively, they've got the talent to get a goal or two. Without Mimmo, mm-hmm. debatable. <laughs> Pinamonti up front. Pinamonti. Lauriante is good. Uh, Ratchic has been okay. Rach- Ratchic, towards Vet, like yeah, sure. Towards Vet. Sure. You know, it's. Like, I'm not blown away by them, bro. I'm not no. blown away by any of these fucking yeah. players except for Lauriante. It's it's just gonna be fun to observe, to be honest with you. Yeah. So so yeah, that's it, man. Um, for this game, to be honest with you, Bologna are in fourth with fifty four points. Um, they've got the the European run, man. They, they've got that safety net of three points between them and Roma. Nine games to go. Let's hope they can hang in there because that coefficient is. You know, you've got England and... and um, Germany. Germany catching up, yeah. Um, on the other hand, of course, as we've just mentioned, <laughs> Empoli down in 17th to 25 points. <laughs> when are we going to start vaping on this podcast is what I want to know, brother. Because when I, when I have a drink, it's just like going mental. Roma 1, Sassuolo 0. Um, <laughs> Roma coming off a 2-2 away draw to Fiorentina and a 1-0 loss to Brighton. Wah, wah, wah. Bitch from little baby. Wah, wah, wah. 1-0 loss doesn't matter. They won on aggregate 4-1. Sassuolo coming off a 1-0 win over Frosinone and the previous encounter between these two sides was Sassuolo 1, Roma 2. The Giallo Rossi lost Dybala, Smalling and Christensen, but Tammy Abraham was on the bench for the first time since his knee surgery in June. Welcome fucking back, Tammy. Welcome back, Tammy. That must have been a pain in the ass for Tammy, obviously, for Roma. Um, but for Roma especially, I think, because Tammy Abraham is one of the most expensive players. One of the highest earners. One of the highest earners with them. I believe above him, Lukaku and Dybala. Um mm-hmm. And that's Tammy Abraham. Can you imagine Spinazzola's Abraham? Spinazzola's up there as well, by the way, who keeps getting injured. Abraham running out into the training ground. And he's looking around. There's Azmoun, Lukaku, Dybala. He's like, what the hell happened here? <laughs> who are these guys? <laughs> where man. am I going to play? <laughs> Literally. Man. The, he, he can be utilized on his day. He's, he's, he's very intelligent, Tammy Abraham, mm-hmm. as a striker. Mm-hmm. Um, remember his first season in Serie A. second one was a nightmare. But his first one, he was unbelievable. I think he was top three goal scorers in the league, man. It was very good. Davide Ballardini's side had towards Vetan Doik suspended with Berardi out for the rest of the season with a torn Achilles tendon. 4-3-3 for De Rossi's men with Svelar in goal on the back line of Spinazzola, Lorente, Mancini and Karsdorp. Spinazzola did go off injured quite early in this game. Pellegrini, Paredes and Cristante formed the midfield three with El Sharawi and Awar flanking Romelu. Also a 4-3-3 formation for Sassuolo with Consigli in goal and the back line of Pedersen, Ehrlich, Ferrari and Viti. A midfield three of Rakic, Obiang and Henrique with Defrel and Lauriante flanking Pinamonti. Now Lukaku missed the target with two headers in the first half where he probably should have done better. But by his standards, who knows if he should have done better. Um, these took place in the fourth minute and in the 45th minute. In the 50th minute, however, just after halftime, Pellegrini cut inside and curled his long-range strike into the bottom corner from around 25 yards out. Brilliant strike, another star in the absence of Paolo Dybala, captain fantastic. In the 67th, Svelar did great to deny Rakic as he got down well. In the 73rd minute, Lukaku did well to outmuscle Ehrlich and get a strike away. At first, I thought he missed another great chance by failing to hit the target, but a replay showed a crucial touch by Ehrlich, showcasing fantastic defending by the Croatian. Sassuolo were looking for an equaliser and almost got one in the 80th, as Bayrami's low cross was deflected goalwards by Roma defender Lorente, and Svilar got the luckiest of touches as the ball was going between his legs, deflecting the strike onto the post. Viti had little time to adjust himself and turn in the rebound, so he mishit the strike high and wide, and Roma got away with the 1-0 victory. 
Again, not vintage the Rossi ball for Roma, but they managed three points against a very stubborn opposition over here as Sassuolo continued to take shape under Ballardini after his debut victory over Frosinone. I wanted to ask you about Sassuolo's chances, but we just so discussed these, that. So these are the toughest games <laughs> for, for a new manager who doesn't have much domestic experience coming up against a team like Sassuolo who are literally fighting for their lives. Mm-hmm. Who have a manager who's been managing since the dinosaurs were around. And Davide Ballardini. You know, he's known to be a master of disrupting play. And of, of just stopping you from playing football. And then smacking you on the counter, man. These are the toughest games for Roma to win. Mm. And the fact that they managed to keep a you know, clean sheet, okay, granted. But the fact that they managed to get across the line in, in, in such a difficult environment... Um, I think I think I had the Rossi here pass another test, to be uh-huh. honest with you. And it, this is also the case of a man-manager, a manager that can get the best out of his players. Because when you can't penetrate a team, when you can't break um, Ballardini ball, okay, what's what's the calcio? What was Catenaccio. The, cate, catenaccio. You need sometimes individual brilliance, and it's about getting the best out of these players, not to take another dig at the fantastic Jose Mourinho, <laughs> right? But that's what Mourinho lacked. He couldn't get the best out of everyone. Mm. Because if you weren't spectacular, you were shit. And only one player was spectacular to him, and it was Dybala, that right? That was just a weird, weird, weird thing to constantly mention in press conferences. Huh? Mm. Like, imagine. Imagine you're you're a manager. Just uh, l- let's move away from football right now. Imagine you are the head of a department at some company, right? And you've got ten employees under you. Imagine in every meeting you're just going on about one Steve employee. Best. Steve's good only. <laughs> the rest, pff, terrible, terrible. The rest, you know, what do you want me to do? These are the these are the numbers we can rack up with this workforce. This is why you get minimum yeah. wage. Because you're see, shit. You see, the other companies, they've got 10 Steves. I have one Steve. You know, yeah. what, the, what the hell kind of, kind of approach fucking, is this? And they would have had Mark, yeah. who before this head of department took over, would have been the main guy. Everyone wants to be Mark. Pellegrini. Yeah. Pellegrini for multiple, multiple seasons before Dybala ever dreamt of joining Roma was their guy. Their star man for seasons and seasons and seasons. People paying over a hundred to take him on Fanta Calcio, bro. Yeah. Because he's he, fucking a, a dead ball specialist. Great at dribbling. Good eye for goal around the area. He's the guy. Good finishing. He's a top fucking player. He's, he's a, born and raised in Rome. The fans absolutely adore him. And this is what it takes. It takes a manager that respects his players that gives them good opportunities in order for them to find their best form. And that's what De Rossi did. And this win, oh, but all, all, they, they got a spectacular goal, that's why they won the game. It has nothing to do with De Rossi. No, it has everything to do with De Rossi, because De Rossi sets these players up by being a, a, a good man manager. Yeah, That's why Pellegrini scored that goal. Absolutely, absolutely, bro. Very, very well put. Thank you. Um, safe to say, Sassuolo could have used Domenico Berardi over here with Gregoire De Frill um, mm. starting out wide. Um, the, the more you look at this team, actually, the more you realize that this is not the Sassuolo of the past. Eh? No way, no. Even when it comes to that, just it's not the Sassuolo with Vlad Kirikes at centre back. The <laughs> mirror. <laughs> yeah, but um, uh, I think I think Roma have been very impressive since the Rossi's appointment. Absolutely. Um, one more thing, Milan Roma, mm. Europa League. Mm. Mm. Give me some. Totti's right. Totti's so. been chatting shit yes. about Milan. Well, what's he been saying? Um, um, Bring him here. I ju- <laughs> <laughs> One second. For our, oh, my oh my god, he's about to drop everything. No, we're fine. We're fine. What about Totti? So a journalist asked Totti, is like, how do you feel about Milan with Milan's, you know, history in Europe with that? Europe DNA Champions League is like, come on! This isn't the Milan of the past. <laughs> I know. Okay. I highly doubt that. That's shit because 
This isn't the Milan of the past. The Milan, the Milan of the past. Of the past. It's talking. a jab, though. It's a it's jab. A, it's a jab. I mean, this isn't the Roma of the past either. Roasted. You know what I mean? Mm. No, it's not. It's not the best version of Roma that has ever existed. <laughs> the fuck. You know, this isn't the Milan of the past, but this is also a Milan who have been causing Roma problems in the past. I don't know how many fixtures. When was the last time Roma beat Milan? Because I like, genuinely before, remember, before Mourinho. Remember. Before Mourinho, yeah. for sure. Pioli's had their number. Now, have Milan faced the Rossi's Roma? No. No. Am I a little bit worried? Absolutely. Yes, yes. I am. Um, we'll see. It's going to be a good encounter, definitely. It's going to be heated. We're talking one leg at the Olympico, one leg at San Siro on a European mm, tie. Mm, mm. And we're going to be in Sardinia, bro. And we're going to be, be in Sardinia watching <laughs> Cagliari take on who's lecture. <laughs> No. no, Atalanta, Atalanta bro. Atalanta, I forgot Atalanta. we're going to watch. We're, we're going to go watch Cagliari get creamed, bro. Yeah, yeah. Hell yeah. Hopefully Lovumbo's mm. back by then. But so I, I can get one of those signs, you know, Lovumbo, give me your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want what's his fucking name's shirt, man. I can't even remember his La name. Padula? I DM'd him the other day, bro. Who did you DM? I DM'd him. Who? What's his name, man? Deola? No, bro. Fucking teardrop. What's ah, his name? Viola. Viola. What did you say? Viola. <laughs> <laughs> I died, so I use Google. You do podcasts? <laughs> <laughs> no, not from Sayas, but I DM them myself. And, and I, I said something like, um, it's cringe, man. I said something like, is that left foot hard work and dedication or a gift from God, brother? I didn't fucking reply. Like, brother, how often is it that someone tells you your left foot is a gift from God? 30k followers. <laughs> you know what I mean? The <laughs> local company I work for has more than fucking followers than you give me a shout bro like I'm, I'm i'm out here respecting you anyway i think that it's gonna be a super tight affair i wouldn't be surprised if roma get it done because with the way that they take control and attack games milan it's like milan are going up against milan milan like taking control and they like attacking roma like taking control mm-hmm. and roma like mm-hmm. attacking before it was a perfect fit why because roma are like have the ball, have the ball. And Milan are like, um, okay, this is literally what we do. Like, And Milan had the ball and they had no problem getting the job done. But now Milan are going to be hit by firepower. Milan are going to be hit by El Sharawi on the wing, Dybala on we'll the other how, how side. We'll see how both sides... as a Trek artista. We'll see how... I'm curious to see how both sides can... can uh, will set up because mm. Roma can totally set up to absorb as can Milan. I highly doubt Milan will. These are two teams who both have European experience. Mm. Um, we know that uh, Roma with this very set of players won the Conference League and got to a Euro- Europa League final. Milan got to the semi-finals of the Champions League with pretty much the squad. So uh-huh, there, there isn't really an advantage when it comes to experience mm. in, any, in any aspect. The one thing I can think of is maybe the team knows Pioli very well and I'm sure Pioli might have a trick up his sleeve mm. or two in these knockout tournaments. Um, uh, Milan have the more experienced manager essentially, mm. but the Rossi's been flying, man. So, uh-huh. so it's impossible to call. It's one of those that you should never put money. Yeah, on. it's um, the winner of Milan Roma will face either West Ham or Bayer Leverkusen. Boom. West Ham are the bubbles, eh? Yeah, they blow bubbles. They bubbles blow in bubbles. the air. <laughs> Bubbles, but but then they're the hardest. Like you know, they're, they're, they're hard. They're, they're hard as fuck. Millwall are the hardest. <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, West Ham. That that's an intim- intimidating atmosphere. Yeah. Going to the West Ham mm. Stadium, man. It's coming out and they're all blowing bubbles. That's, you get soap in your eyes. Oh my god! Like, how how are we gonna play soap against? in my eyes? God damn! <laughs> <laughs> Roma in fifth on fifty one points. Sassuolo in nineteenth on twenty three points, but two points from survival. Caught me off guard. <laughs> the, next, <laughs> the next game we're going to be covering is a fun one. It's Frosinone 2, Lazio 3. Yes, now, it's important to notice that Lazio had lost their previous four matches. Sarri was sacked. And for this game... No! <laughs> Sarri wasn't Sarri, sacked. Sorry, I keep saying that. Sarri resigned. <laughs> you, you just keep... like potato. Someone's not going to hire him because of you. <laughs> I'm Jake guy making a claim. <laughs> but yeah, um, they had... I swear I have it written somewhere over here. The Giovanni Martus- Martusciello was the caretaker manager. There you go. For now, yes. Shout out Giovanni Martusciello. So for Martusciello, it was Christos Mandas in goal. 
Yes, uh, to replace the injured Providel, who's what the hell? probably still fuming and his teammates <laughs> for having to go up in the 90th minute. Um, it was a 4-3-3, the same system started to use. Pellegrini was on the left, Marisic on the right, with Chasale and Romagnoli as a centre-back duo. Luis Alberto Cataldi and Guendouzi were in the middle, with Zaccani on the left, Felipe Anderson on the right, and Immobile up front. For Frozenone, it was Turati in goal with Lirola on the right, Zortea on the left, Okoli and Romagnoli at the back. So far, that's one player they own. <laughs> Brescianini, Berenchea and Mazzitelli were in the midfield three with Sule on the right, Jelly on the left and Walid Kedira up front. Now, Castellanos emerged as the hero this game, coming off the bench and scoring twice to secure a stunning 3-2 comeback. Um, Frozenone started aggressively and they actually took the lead through Paul Lirola's header from Zortea's cross. This was the club's 100th Serie A goal. Lazio responded with Zaccani's equalizer, converting Guendouzi's cross. Um, Turati denied Chira on Mobile's angled drive, keeping the scores level before the break. In the second half, Lazio intensified their attack. Um, with Immobile testing Turati early on. Um, Castellanos eventually did come on to replace um, Immobile and scored with his first touch, <coughs> um, heading in Luis Alberto's free kick, um, towering over the defender to mm. give Lazio the lead. He almost added another with a spectacular volley that was saved by Turati, and then he capitalized on a rebound from Chazales' deflected attempt to extend Lazio's lead. Frosinone fought back as Kedira pulled one back with an acrobatic overhead kick that we discussed in the intro. Um, he had also leveled three minutes later um, following a howler from the goalkeeper that uh, mm. that's replacing Provedel, Christos Mandas. But it was ruled offside. Yeah, bro, um, and that would be um, it. So... I think that this was a very important victory for Lazio. They they're currently in between managers, which is a very yeah. awkward place to be because, like, how can you take Giovanni Martuscello seriously? You know what I mean? When when you know that next week someone's going to be coming in to replace him, and Tudor, who's a very um, a very good manager, yeah. essentially. So I guess at the same time, this was kind of like an audition. They knew Tudor was going to be watching. So I guess that might have driven Castellanos, for example, because I don't think he had scored since maybe the Frozen on a return leg. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, they did they did very well to to remain in the game. But Frozen on just remained that team man that just can't shut up shop when they take a lead, and that will always concede goals. Um, That's it. it. And, and if you look at the chances created and the goals scored, it literally makes perfect sense. The XG for Frosinone 2, the XG for Lazio 3.26. So that, that adds up nicely. There you go. <laughs> shots on goal, literally was an action-packed game. I to end stuff. We mm-hmm. had Frosinone with five shots on goal, Lazio with seven shots on goal. Um, yeah, this was, this was a very nice game to watch. Yeah, um, I mean, Frosinone bring it against these big teams. It was a very, very similar game they had against Milan. I believe it was a 3-2 victory for Milan as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And they got that win at the very end, if I'm not mistaken. They were 2-1 down as well. Frosinone are fearless. Um, It's not always, as we we often say, sustainable. Um, But it's one that has been effective in taking them up to Serie A. And also, keep in mind, up until... Four months ago, three months ago, this was a mid-table team, Frozen On. Yeah. They were doing bits in Serie A. Um, but it's almost like for every goal they score, they are guaranteed to concede one. Um, they are capable of taking the game to their opponents, but in a shootout like this, you go to a shootout as Frozen On against Lazio. <laughs> then quality of individuals is gonna play a part, right? And yeah, that's it. The, the the better quality is surprisingly <laughs> Lazio. Yeah, that, and that's and that's pretty much it, bro. Um, speaking of auditions, by the way, before Castellanos, I don't know if you noticed, but after the well, I actually discussed it. After his first goal, he gathered mm. the whole team, including the subs, together, and they huddled. And they had like a moment together. And I really admire that leadership because Castellanos at the end of the day has big shoes to fill. Granted, Chiro Mobile is not what he was. But we're talking about 
a living legend. Yeah. We're talking about the all-time Lazio top scorer. It's not every day that the top scorer of the club still plays. So it's nice to see that he, he scored and then he also huddled everyone together, kind of had this... He showed that he was a leader, you know, at yeah. the same time, which is which is very yeah very leader important. team player, especially yeah. when there is much like Juve, there, there is a divide going on at Lazio right now. So much so that the manager resigned himself. He up and left. How often do you see that midway through a season? Not, yeah. not often at all. Um, so great, great sportsmanship by Tati. And Lotito has shit housed himself to another good manager. I don't know how he's yeah. doing this. Um, mm-hmm. Tudor, who was a manager who, who was wanted by Juventus not too long ago. Yeah. Um, he, you'll remember him in Serie A managing Udinese and Verona. He's 45 years old. He's Croatian. And his last job was at Marseille, which he left in June after leading Marseille to third place in the French League. So this is a, a very good manager. You know, yeah. I mean, Lazio might have a resurgence with them. They might be fighting for a top four again next season. Who knows? Maybe, maybe. They're, they they definitely got a good a good manager. They, they definitely got a good Absolutely. manager. It's not a, a, a name that, you know, uh, you typically see big teams go for because they'd rather go for Brocky. a big name. Yeah. yeah, but at least it's a fucking yeah. Brocky, right? Yeah. Well, Tudor nowadays is kind of a he big did, name. He did, he's one of he the great coming with Verona, managers. bro. Yes, and he did yes. the great with and, Verona. And Matthias had mentioned a very good point on our on our Patreon group chat, three ninety nine a month subscribe. <laughs> um, that <laughs> that when Tudor was at Hellas Verona, Simeone had his best ever season. Ah, uh, uh, Simeone, mm, remember mm, that season where yes, Simeone kept scoring, yes. essentially earning him the move to Napoli. That was under Tudor, and. As a striker, Castellanos does have similar mm. qualities to mm. Simeone. So it would be interesting to see. Maybe next year, Castellanos will be a player to keep an eye on when mm. it comes to, for example, our Fanta Calcio players. Yeah, yeah, it could, could very much be. I might bang in a few. Uh-huh. Even with, Vero- with, with, with Verona, bro, they were, I believe, top 10 with Tudor. Ele- they, they were like By the 11th, end of it or 11th, at 11th, 10th with Tudor. Yeah, when, when he was there, I mean, but remember he, we had the whole bet of Verona and Sassuolo are going to finish up ah, over each other. Yes, that that was course. Tudor. Wow, mm-hmm. man, we've been doing this for a while, huh? Yeah, man, we're 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 about to hit three years. At the end of the season, we will we'll be three years, which is fucking it's crazy. It took us man. three years to get on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It. So this hard-earned Lazio victory has pushed them up to ninth. <laughs> No, no, it was very important for them to win because they were in a four-match losing streak in all competitions. So, so yeah, they're ninth with 43 points, while, on the other hand, Frosinone are in 18th with 24 points. Pardon me. The next game we're going to be covering is Udinese nil Torino 2. Udinese were coming off a 2-1 away victory over Lazio, uh, whilst Torino were coming off a 1-1 away draw to Napoli. The previous encounter was a 1-1 draw. Ewan Pears was suspended with Delafo and Ebos injured. Um, Juric set out a touchline ban with Gigi, Tamez, Illich and Shores on the treatment table. 3-5-2 formation for Udinese with Okoye in goal and a back line of Gianetti, Bijol and Ferreira. Kamara on the left, Pereira on the right and the midfield three of Payero, Wallace and Loverich with Tuvan and Luca up front. 3-4-2-1 for Lazio. Um, sorry, for Torino, with Milinkovic Savic in goal and a backline of Voivoda, Bongiorno and Mazina. Bellanova on the right, Ricardo Rodriguez on the left and a double pivot of Ricci and Ginetis, with Vlasic and Okereke playing behind Duvan Zapata. In the fourth minute, Duvan Zapata played Okereke through with a beautiful touch only for the Nigerian to overcook his strike. In the seventh, Vlasic hit the post for Torino with a Colombian. What did I say? That? No, ah, no, bro. Okay, 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 okay. I was gonna say, bro. <laughs> <laughs> in the seventh, okay, minute, okay. <laughs> in the seventh minute, Vlasic hit the post for Torino with a great low strike from outside the area. So Torino really started offensive, bro. Fourth minute, seventh minute, then the tenth minute, Zapata, the Colombian, opened the scoring. Uh, he scored a looping header after a Beckham-esque cross by Voivoda from the right-hand side. That's another wall of the Lex. That was a wicked cross. What a cross. What, you saw the spin, the, the trajectory. No, at the he end. wasn't alone, but he was alone. Like, like yeah. after, like, 
with the trajectory of the ball, he placed it perfectly on top of his head for him to seem like he was alone. He wasn't Dude. alone. Dude, and that was kind of a slam dunk as it well. It was a, a looping header, eh? Looping, looping header. header. How are Mota doing? Mota 2-2. Oh, shit. And the Sesco guy scored. <laughs> Roasted. Um, Torino continued to dominate in the first half as Okoye kept to Dineze in the game by denying Okereka twice. And in the 52nd minute, Torino made it 2 through Vlasic. Uh, Vlasic received the ball just inside the area from Duvan Zapata before he cut past Gianetti and slotted into the bottom corner to get his first goal since January. In the 71st minute, Okoye pulled off another great save, this time to deny a Duvan Zapata header. I thought that Torino came out in this game and were like, let's go for their throats. Like, they're absolutely relentless attack after it was like attack. fuck what you heard you know literally it's literally. what you hear and listen <laughs> <laughs> they they were on one this game they looked inspired man and to be honest it's like against like with the Neza and torino kind of like two mm. tough teams to break down you know but um torino torino man continue to be the best of the rest and what else can they do look above them Look above Torino. Yeah, this and was the point Alan made. Yeah, exactly. This is where I got the point from. Thank yeah. you, Alan. <laughs> Look above Torino. Like, if they, how much better can they get? They've got Bologna, Roma, Atalanta, Napoli, Fiorentina, Lazio, Milan, Juve, Inter. Monza. Monza as well. <laughs> One point there. above. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. But no, you're, you're absolutely right. That was a very good point by, um, by Alan. It's like Juric has probably taken them uh, as far as he can possibly go. Um, we'll see if Cairo invests. <laughs> Good one, bro. Yeah. yeah, a bit better than than in the past, right? Yeah. Um, but they, they've picked up at you know, They're not as um, moody as they were at the start of the uh-huh, season. They've shown some like, consistency. Uh-huh, they they had a score. good draw to Napoli. They Bella Nova changed everything. Bella Nova is brilliant, man. Bella Nova, take him to the Euros, man. Um, on the other hand, the Nez are struggling. Um, they endured a difficult outing. They failed to register a single shot on target in the first half, and they uh, were facing vocal criticism from their own supporters, also being booed. Um, manager Luca Gotti faced scrutiny from the fans and was subjected to jeers um, as his team struggled to cope with Torino's dominance. Um, this obviously highlights the pressure that's mounting on the club amidst this relegation battle. Um, imagine... Again, because I, I, I can't stand the booing personally, but imagine being in a relegation dogfight, right? Struggling, struggling. Every point counts. You're losing and you're getting booed by your own supporters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you, what, what? Okay. So you want to boo them so that they make better decisions perhaps next summer for Serie B because you kept booing them and they kept regressing. What are I, they booing? Like, Choffi just led Lots, uh, just led Udinese to a victory over Lazio a week ago. They drew to Salernitana the week prior. Granted, they had a red card and they lost to, you know, Udinese or whatever. But this season, Udinese have beaten Milan. Uh, they've beaten Juve. Mm. You know, they, they again they've drawn many games that they should have won, of course. And I don't think Choffi is the the right guy, to be honest. To oh my God, I said Gotti. You said Gotti. Yeah, yeah, I'm apologies. Really drilling this yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I do think that they could do better than Chaffee. Um However, uh, to boo him, it's pointless. It's redundant. This team's essentially in a relegation battle. Mm. Might as well try to stick behind the team, especially when the team has so much talent on it. Yeah. Um, it will take a moment of brilliance. You know, Torino's not the game you're going to win. No. Torino's a game that's going to be difficult. At most, you have one point out of it. Now, one thing I wanted to mention about Udinese, bro. You know Simone Pafundi. Not you know him, but have yes, you heard yes, of him? You yes, know, yes, okay, yes, okay. absolutely. So under 21 GOAT. He's a 17 year old. He's a 17 year old. And he's playing five. for the under 21s. Yes, exactly. Um, he's. In like three years, he climbed. And I have I have everything written down over here. I actually have a, a little segment on him. Mm. So he is currently on loan for some reason. It's not like Odinese could use a, a magician, a five foot five player who's been hailed to be the the next Di Natale mm. or, or the next Messi by some. You know, yeah. um, he's on loan in the Swiss Super League at Club Luazan Sport, right? And in his last three games, he's got a goal against Servette. <laughs> 
He's got an assist against Young Boys and a goal and an assist against Scotland under 19s. Come on, Pafundi. He's 18 nowadays, sorry, he's no longer 17. Um, but he has, in the past 17 months, gone from Italy under 17 to Italy under 19 to Italy under 20, and he's also been called up to the Italian. Oh senior. my god, I said he played for the under 21s, and he's literally he's the, the only one team. that he jumped it's, like yeah, 17, right. 19, 20 senior team. <laughs> I think. They could have used him. It's not like Udinese have this bloody thing wrapped up, you know. They're clearly looking for solutions. They're looking for, for some I mean, creativity. There it, was a point in the cup, sorry. They brought on Pafundi mm, in, in the cup. And I remember this. everything was going around him. Yeah. Everything. Mm-hmm. Udinese were just giving him the ball. He was passing and moving. And, and they were trying to give him the ball back. He's a player who... Who, who demands the ball, you know, he's mm. got this kind of Confident for his age, man, Absolutely. very confident for yeah. his age. Look at him, man, he was a young guy, like... Very young, I mean. it's, it's ridiculous. Um, but I, I guess, I, I'm never against a young player going out on loan, right? I don't think Udinese expected to be in this position, and I don't think they expected Pafundi they, they sent him out on loan so halfway good. through the season. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah, it is weird. It is weird. Um, <laughs> well, hopefully, at least as long as some more pl- play time, so that next yeah. season he'll be even more vital for Udinese. Um, but yeah, Udinese have have a lot of work to do if they want to avoid this relegation battle, um, because they are significantly struggling to get goals, and and perhaps creativity is is something that they lack, and maybe someone like Pafundi is is a breath of fresh air that they can bring in um, mm-hmm. well, at least they'll have to do that next season the next game for them is against Sassuolo and then they play Inter Roma Verona Bologna Napoli Lecce Empoli and Frosinone so once again these teams these lowly teams man there's a lot to play for left mm-hmm. and they all have to play each other still mm-hmm. somehow it feels like they've been playing each other for a while because no? there's, eight there's teams, so many seven yeah. teams mm-hmm. that are battling relegation this is gonna be so juicy it is man it is our girlfriends are gonna fucking hate us which is gonna be the start of <laughs> summer and we're gonna be like no no there's Odinese Verona <laughs> let's go to the beach <laughs> like no there's no Wi-Fi on the beach <laughs> um I think it's safe to move on from this game. I have some more talking points, but to be honest, we got the the main points nailed down. I just want to praise Duvan Zapata for his 10th goal of the season. Um, he also grabbed an assist in this game. He really has found his form again. He was struggling in his latter, in the latter stages of his career at Atalanta. I feel like he's found himself now at Torino once again. Fantastic by the Nigerian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Rek is the Nigerian. Um Udinese are in 14th on 27 points, so that's 3 points from the drop, while Torino are in 11th on 41 points. Monza played Cagliari, bro, and I was quite disappointed with Cagliari. Yes, um, same. Actually, let's get into the, the lineups before I start. Yeah, <laughs> wanna, bro, Let me tell the, you about Cagliari. Let me tell you about Cagliari, man. All right? Their closest go- opportunity was a dos and a header. So, so Monza, 4-2-3-1. Di Gregorio in goal. Birindelli on the right. Andrea Carboni on the left. Itzo and Mari as a centre-back partnership with Pessina and Warren Bondo as the midfield double pivot. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Would you say it like that? <laughs> Warren Bondo. You know Milan were after Warren Bondo? Where are we? Because of their strong connections in the scouting network mm. of France. But apparently Monza has snapped him off. He's pretty good. Now Warren Bondo. Very good player. <laughs> You're laughing because the name doesn't match the surname, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Um, it's like what Michael Follerun shot yeah, makes it's, me it's lol. It's so funny. <laughs> Yeah. Andrea Colpani was on the right with Danny Motta on the left. Daniel Maldini, Maldini playing behind Juric up front. It's been such a long day, bro. I'm about to have a nervous <laughs> breakdown same. laughing. Same, same. Um, Simone Scuffè was in goal in a 4 4 1 1 formation with Augello on the left, Zappa on the right, Vitesca and Dossen as a centre back partnership with Yankto on the left, Nandes on the right, Deola and Makumbu in the middle with Shomorodov playing behind Lapadou. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, bro. I can't stop um, now. Yes, so this game was decided by a brilliant free kick. A moment yes. of brilliance by Literally. Daniel Maldini. Literally. Cagliari didn't create anything. Zero. They had a close free kick, I guess, that, that kind of clipped the post by Lapadula. It was low mm. and kind of driven. It was one of those cheeky ones, but didn't quite work. Uh-huh. 
Um, Dosena, I got the closest, but then, man, the, one of the things I want to talk to you most about this game, Colombo. Mm. The worst, or two terrible misses, but one of them was the worst miss I've seen since Cyril Lingonj with, with Veron. Remember that moment? Mm. It was one-on-one, and he kind of went for a dink, and he completely yeah. missed the target. The same thing for Colombo, clean through completely one-on-one. He, he'd just come on totally fresh, bro. Um, the goalkeeper kind of rushes out a little bit. He goes to chip him, totally mishits the ball, bro. It didn't even cross the line, nah. the ball. I think, what an embarrassing finish. What an embarrassing finish. You don't even get it past the line. There's no power generated. He completely fluffed his line. That's embarrassing. And, and the fact that fucking how old is Juric? They brought Juric in um, to start ahead of Colombo. Colombo came on, to be fair. He did start Juric. Exactly. Juric is starting ahead of Colombo. Ah, yeah, so okay. that's it's embarrassing for Colombo. He's fucking mm. twenty something can... year, year old Milan prodigy. And he's being can Juric is starting ahead of him. Ah, this this whole Colombo thing is very weird. I don't know. He kind of he scores everywhere he goes on loan, mm. but he has phases where he explodes and he just dies. Like, yeah, he doesn't. Do he's inconsistent, anymore. right? Super inconsistent, man. And he's not very young. He's, I think, 21, 22, something like that. So, so it would be nicer if he, it would be good if he got some consistency mm. to him. Um, just confirm his 22 age. years 22 old. 22 years old, yes, man. It would be nice to see him getting a bit more consistent with it. Uh, yeah. and, and this was just a complacent kind of showing for him. And after he missed the trip, he was laughing. How are you laughing after missing the trip so terribly? <laughs> Oh, no, sorry, I almost vomited. <laughs> um, um, not a good performance by Cagliari. No. Um, they hung in there, to be honest. I mean, uh, could have t- taken something at the end. They could have been right back into it. Because essentially, when you manage to maintain a 1-0 deficit, you, you can get back into it at any time. Yeah. You know, and quickly, the narrative changes. Mm-hmm. But that wasn't the case uh, this time for Cagliari. Uh-huh. Disappointing. I think, I think they, were, they were missing some dudes as well. Of course, Luvumbo has been out. Lovumbo um, and uh, Gaetano as well yeah. Um, oh, yeah, wasn't wasn't anywhere here and and at least when they th- like in the last few matches where they were on a positive streak like okay they didn't have they didn't have Lovumbo but Gaetano was their star guy during that period and now that to start with Shumorodov behind La Padula okay mm. Shumorodov had a he grabbed a few goals recently of course he was against Fazio yeah yeah um but yeah, absolutely no. Not 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 a good performance by by Cagliari. These performances make me think that they are strong candidates for relegation. Yeah, um, unfortunately so. Unfortunately so. Um, I definitely hope not. We're gonna be in in Sardinia with our um, fucking shirts off. With our shirts off, what? hoping to God that dude. The the halftime show this game was hilarious. <laughs> what was it? There were like there, I think there was every school in Sardinia, right? And and the children came out and they're walking around the pitch and I don't even know what they were doing. They're just walking around like the teachers are like guiding them, like like herding them like sheep, and they're just walking. And everyone's clapping at these kids. Like, yeah, but do you do you know if there's any significance? Thought, like maybe they survived a fire or something. I thought. I thought they were hard, to be honest, bro. I was very disappointed seeing the family atmosphere. You thought they were what? I thought they were hard. No. And then they come no. out here with the kids. I'm kidding. Like, it's always nice to see the man. The funniest really? shit ever was when Sassuolo, all of a sudden, like, <laughs> decent turnout for Sassuolo in this game. And, and it turns out it's, it's like a school outing. <laughs> just a bunch of fucking, like, eight-year-olds, seven-year-olds <laughs> just packing the fucking stage. <laughs> going... Nuts, bro. They were going fucking crazy. Like. <laughs> it was so funny because Sassuolo had squared like an equalizer or something <laughs> and then pants, the pants. They were falling <laughs> over each other, jumping, bro. Like mental. I love what fucking drunk energy children have, man. They have you are... ever seen children go fucking crazy yeah. and there's like not a sip of alcohol or something? Bro, every day this week. There you go. That, that's, it's uh, horrible. That's, that's yeah, good. It's, it's too much. Yeah, fucking. But anyway, mm-hmm. <laughs> they're like they're like little. They're like shrunken old people on LSD. <laughs> 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 it's like they're really creative. 
Mm-hmm. They see all these colors, really happy by life, but they occasionally shit themselves. And fall on the floor. And yeah. don't fall on the floor. Is that uh, it for, yeah, that, for that's, your I game? I mean, bro? that's that's pretty much it for that game. Um, and it was Cagliari, of course, um, in 16th with 26 points. Monza. And Monza are in 10th with 42 points. Yes, perfect limit table uh, for Monza. There you go. Again. Still in the running for a conference league spot. Of course they are. Because mm. that's 8th this season. 43. Monza 42, just one point away. Yeah. We might see Monza on a European night, but I think to be honest, now this has been a good run for them. I think it's bound to end. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean they beat they beat Milan. They were on a high. I, I, it. They have been pretty consistent lately. Let's just say that. Yeah, yeah. No, they they're good. And keep keep in mind that like now there's a bit more continuity. Last season it was like okay, a bunch of these guys are on loan. They just got they just got promotion um how sustainable is this project they just threw loads of money um berlusconi just threw in loads of cash but now they're showing they managed to keep the players that were important to them you know the the pessina so on and so forth and actually it, it's showing that this project is a is a strong one mm-hmm. the fact mm-hmm. that they're 10th again this season Great signs, man. And they're constantly a pain in the ass for the bigger teams as well. The last game, recovering, is a relegation dogfight. Jake and I were supposed to be at this game, but we opted out because we said Salernitana are essentially already relegated, so let's Mm -hmm. go watch Cagliari instead. Um, Salernitana nel Lecce won. Salernitana were coming off a 4-2 loss to Cagliari. That would have been a mental one, bro. Um, Lecce coming off a 1-0 home loss to Verona, and the previous encounter was a 2-0 victory for Lecce. The visitor sacked Daversa last week after he head-butted Verona striker Tomas Henry, <laughs> along with a shite run of 9 defeats in the last 12 matches. Um, this was the debut for their new manager, Luca Gotti. Banda was suspended, um, while Kaba and Dermaku were injured, and the 4-3-3 formation was a scrapped for a 4-2-2. Castano sat out a ban with Pierozzi, while Bulaedia was frozen out after, it, after refusing to come off the bench. Still frozen mm. out. Mm-hmm. Um, 4-3-1-2 formation for Salernitana. We've seen it all with Salernitana, bro. What the hell? <laughs> This is a man. This is a man. This is a drawing of a man sideways. Head. You seeing it? That's crazy, bro. That's that's uh, what are you doing, bro? Um liver on. You're just cooking up a 4-3-1-2, bro. Um Costil in goal and the back line of Bradarich, Pirola, Manolas and Gyomber. Um a midfield three of Basic, Major and Kulibali with Kandreva ahead of them and Wiesman and Chuana starting up front. Really good. 4 2 3 1 for Lecce with Falcone and goal and the back line of Jean Dre, Pongracic, Basquerotto, and Gallo. Ramadani and Blin in the double pivot uh, with Almqvist, Udon, and Piccoli playing behind Kristovic. That's interesting. That's um, totally wrong. Odd, it should be yeah. Almqvist and Udon playing uh, behind Kristovic and Piccoli. Positions. Let me see if that's really the case. So we're talking um, Piccoli, where is the number 91? That's no, it's look. it's right. He was out on the wing. Interesting. Piccoli uh-huh, <clears throat> played a bit further away from goal. I, I would think that if they had to choose one to play further away from goal, it would be Kristovic with his shooting boots being off. I don't know, because Kristovic is purely a poacher. That seems to be his game. I mean, and Piccoli is a target man. But I guess he could cross at the far post. I guess, yeah. I guess. Um, so the... Lecce won this game through a Guillaume Baron goal, which took place in the 17th minute. It was a cross by jean that caused some commotion in the Salernitana box, as Angvis took two swipes at goal before Guillaume turned it into his own net, silencing his own fans, essentially. Now, from here on out, Falcone was the main difference between the two sides, as he kept a clean sheet with several great stops to deny Salernitana's desperate attacks, because, believe me, Salernitana were actually attacking. Um, he pulled off a great save to deny a Chuan half volley. An even better save to deny Maggiore at the end of the first half, where he made himself big and was brave to commit. He went on to position himself well to deny Simi. 
then deny a dangerous cross shot by Gomez, where he waited for the perfect moment to react, anticipating a touch from the rushing Salernitana forwards. <laughs> What's that, bro? Liverani. <laughs> Liverani. Um, but Falcone is a fantastic, fantastic goalkeeper, and it's not the first time we're saying this about Falcone. Mm-hmm. Genuinely, um, the only reason Lecce won this game because Salernitana actually, for the first time, looked pretty good. I mean, that's what Liberani is meant to give you, you know, an offensive kind of weapon. Salernitana came out, they dominated possession, they had all the pressure in the world to try to get something out of this. Lecce could sit back and absorb, and that's what they did. And to be honest with you, um, Kristovic has to be the luckiest and lucky player ever. Like, mm. You know what I mean? Like, he, he hasn't. He has been, he started off the season, he exploded and he scored a handful of goals, four or five, something like that. And then he, he went dry after for a while, missing good chances. And now that he started scoring again, none of them are actually his. Mm, like he scored two goals recently <laughs> and like both of them have been given as own yeah, goals. That's true. Um, that's yes, true. so so Electra could just literally afford to sit back and just pounce on an opportunity like that, a very messy mm. one, and they, they managed to get it over the line. And Liverani was therefore sacked. Yeah. This is Lecce's first away win this season. Obviously, everyone's like, um, what do you call it? Um, everyone's big events take place against Salernitana. Mm, of course, you know, this is a free win for everyone at the moment. The records are broken against Salernitana. Um, Lecce, I was going to say they're the goats of relegation, six pointers, but they're really not because they drew to Frosinone and they lost to Verona. Lecce are doing an Udinese this season. In what sense? In the sense that they had a crazy start to the point that they ah, were top four. They were, aha, uh-huh, Lecce uh, are fourth uh-huh. episode title. Exactly. And then they just. Yeah. <laughs> all the way down, but they, they acquired and accumulated so many points early on in the season that it doesn't mm. actually matter. Um, but they are cutting it tight with nine games uh-huh. to go. Um, just some news, obviously, the Verani has been sacked after this, um, after just five matches in charge, and they're set to appoint Stefano Colantuono, their fourth coach of the season. More coaches um, than victories. Yeah, yeah, fun fact. Le Verani was their third coach of the campaign, as Sousa was dismissed on October 10th after one win and three draws and five defeats in all competitions. Inzaghi actually lasted 18 games between Serie A and the Coppa Italia, overseeing three victories, four stalemates and 11 losses. Liverani was appointed February 11th and had by far the worst average of the three, earning a single draw, three goals and conceded 12. There were reports that Nzaghi could be recalled, <coughs> seeing as he's still under contract, but Sport Italia, Tutto Mercato Web and Sky Sport Italia noted that President Danilo Iervolino rejected the request to extend his contract. They will instead promote Colantuono, Antuono, who actually he was in charge of their youth academy and had previously coached in Serie A with Catania, Perugia, Atalanta, Palermo, Torino and Udinese. I don't think this is a decision for the club to stay in Serie A. I think they'll do their best to stay in Serie A. But I think they see more potential in someone that knows the club. Um, they'd rather go down to Serie B with someone that knows the club and knows how to get them up rather than with Liverani. Yeah, um, absolutely. That um, definitely makes sense. Um <sighs> Colin Tuono has been around for a while. He started his managerial career in 2002. He has coached the likes of Catania, Perugia, Atalanta, Palermo, Torino, Udinese. He's had many multiple stints at the same t- team. Mm-hmm. Funnily enough, since 2017, he has only ever coached Salernitana. There you so go. He coached them for a season in 2017. Stopped. Probably got sacked. Um, coached them again in 2021 for a season. Got sacked. Now 2024, and we'll see. So yeah, he's just got Salernitana. He's just waiting for Salernitana's phone call constantly. This yeah, week. yeah, he loves Salernitana, and don't we all, brother? Don't we all? Salernitana are still dead last on just 14 points. Um, honestly, 19th place Sassuolo are on 23. So you do the math; they're quite some distance behind. That's nine points. Um, from from 19th place, so it's not even like from safety or something. Yeah. Lecce are in 13th on 28 points, and they're three points from, uh, sorry, they're four points from 18th place. Frosinone. Well, I guess that's pretty much it for this episode. We have a weekend of no Serie A. So like when there are no games on TV, I don't know what to do. 
I don't know what to do. I feel like I should be checking something and I don't know hey. what it is. I go on live score, there's nothing. Like Why couldn't I have Algerian league? I, I, bro, I missed so many games this weekend because of fucking St. Patrick's Day. Like, if only it was... There was no football when there was St. Patrick's Day. That would have been mental. Bro thinks he's Irish. I mean, all of Malta think they're Irish, bro. Yeah. But anyway, thank you very much for listening, guys. Pardon me, Jesus Christ. We've been your hosts, Matt and Jake from Serie A Spotlight. We will see you all next week still. We've, we're cooking We've up something We've got a surprise. Yeah. Um, take care. We'll see you soon and we love you all.